or better ways of, better ways of eating um sorry resulting in people being less depressed overweight tired bloated and inflamed and her own personal experience of transforming her health motivated her to establish the transformation clinic in 1998. Taryn looks at a person as a whole being and not as a series of symptoms that have to be treated. She focuses on nutrition, good eating practices, exercise and mental health. She's based in Fairlawn, Johannesburg and she is a functional medicine certified health coach. Please welcome Karen Colin. Please, everybody, before she starts, I want everybody to mute your sound so we could hear everybody well. Okay? Thank you. Taryn, you have to unmute your. Uh, Taryn, you have to unmute yourself. So. Great. Okay, I've been given five minutes to talk, and that is my allotted time. So I'm going to try and fit as much in as I possibly can in five minutes and before Susan comes and cuts me off. So we discussed a whole lot of topics, and one of the ones that I thought was the most important, not really related to what you're going to be discussing today with the doctors, but um, it cuts across everybody that I see. I specialize in autoimmune diseases, and I've never found... Um, anybody um, with an autoimmune disease that does not have a digestive problem that um, is able to stabilize their blood sugar levels very well. So I decided that I'm going to talk about how to stabilize blood sugar levels in the next five minutes. Okay. And um, my thinking is if you cannot stabilize your blood sugar levels, you cannot stabilize your mood, your memory, your gut, the fatigue, um, your weight, there's nothing you cannot stabilize, your sleep as well, if you do not stabilize blood sugar levels. And what I notice with a lot of people is they just, they're just going on this roller coaster ride throughout the day. They're not eating properly, they're skipping meals, or they're eating too much, or they're eating the wrong types of food. And I looked at this over a period of time, and I've, I've come, I brought a sort of it's not your conventional way of eating. It's not your breakfast, lunch, and supper, and two snacks in between as we hear, um, as we've been taught over the years. But I've redesigned it to actually fit in to stabilize blood sugar levels. And what I've worked out, there's two times of the day where blood sugar levels are really, really unstable. And that is one of them is first thing in the morning when people wake up. And the other is at 2.30 to 4 o'clock in the afternoon. It can be 2.30 to 5 o'clock in the afternoon. And I think all of us actually know what it feels like in the afternoon when you've got that blood sugar level dip and you all you're thinking about is having a cup of coffee or a cup of tea or a packet of crisps or a donut or something like that. You're not thinking, well, I need a nice little bit of protein or some vegetables. You're actually thinking, I need something just to give me that lift. And what happens is you go into this dip and you become more anxious, more moody, more tired, more irritable. And if you've got digestive problems, you will find that during these times that they're actually worse. So if you get headaches, they're much worse. If you get bloating, it's much worse. So all these symptoms get amplified during this time. And then what happens is it takes you many hours to get out of these dips. So if you have one in the morning, it's most certainly going to catch you in the afternoon. And then it's going to catch you during the night as well. So then you don't sleep very well. So when your blood sugar levels become unstable, your cortisol, your stress hormone goes up. And if your stress hormone goes up, your, your, your um, insulin and your blood sugars become unstable. So what I want to just talk about very quickly is how to stabilize your blood sugar levels. And the two times of the day that are the most important to get right are your breakfast and your 2.30 to 4 o'clock. And those are the times when you need your two best meals. It's not to say that 10, 11 o'clock isn't important or your supper is not important, but you want to catch those dips before the dip happens. And Susan has been trying this out, and I think she's actually felt how the difference in actually eating properly in the afternoon. And from a Parkinson's point of view, you also do not want to eat your biggest meal at night because then you lie down and go to sleep and then you have all these reactions you almost want to have supper between 2.30 and 4 o'clock and make sure that you eat a light meal at supper time. 
So you want to catch that protein. And I understand that you've got to keep your medication away from protein, but you want to eat an hour to an hour and a half after waking up and make sure you have the best breakfast and you have the best 2.30 to 4 o'clock meals. And I teach people how to do that. And then you have your 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock and you have your supper. They've all got to remain the same size. I don't like my clients to snack. So I've got a little bowl here that I always show my clients. I've got different ones for different people, but it's a small little bowl that you eat out of. It sits in the palm of your hand because you, you want to have four small bowls throughout the day so that you stabilize your blood sugar levels. And you make sure that those bowls have a little bit of protein. You want to make sure you really, really double up on all your vegetables and your salads and your greens. And I will be going into those because I'll be starting with a, each time there's a lecture for the rest of this year and I'll be covering of why you need to eat your greens, why you need to eat your colors and all of those kind of things. But you want the most comprehensive little meal that's finely chopped, finely grated, finely shredded, that you can sit and chew properly. It's not about the maximum amount that you can eat. It's actually the minimum with the maximum amount of nutrition. I hope that makes sense, is that it's about how much more color you can get on your plate, um, how many more greens you can get on your plate. I always say to my clients, if your diet consists of brown, yellow, and white, you are malnutritioned. You are badly nutritioned. It's about how much more color, how many more antioxidants. And I will be going through this with you. I also will be sharing a whole lot of recipes and, um, and tips and things on the website. But it's, how can I explain this? It's, well, let me come back to that because I'm really, it's, it's only a few minutes I've got to speak. But one of the other things we could also look, look at are smoothies. And um, sometimes people find that smoothies are a lot better to eat. Um, or drink. And um, we can also get an incredible amount of nutrition in that smoothie. We want to cut as many sugars out our diets as possible. We want to cut out as many of those, those simple carbohydrates and include as many of those good complex carbs as possible. And also learn to use your vegetables as carbohydrates. So an example of that would be um, instead of using a whole lot of rice or potatoes or chips or bread or something like that, um, finely grate and shred um, raw vegetables or even make roasted veggies and you put them at the bottom of your bowl and then you put your little stew or your casserole or your little bits of chicken with a bit of avo and stuff on top and you could actually use that as your carbohydrate. I, I hope this makes sense. Um, to people. I don't know if anyone can nod or something like that so I can see if I'm making any sense. And um, I'll also be teaching you how to make an incredible great green smoothie where you can put the most phenomenal nutrition in it, getting all those vitamins and, and minerals that you need. Another thing I also encourage my clients is to do a lot of gut healing and not to take a million supplements. It's not about how many supplements you can take you can actually learn to use your food as, a, as your supplement base because a lot of people can't swallow properly and um, to get tablets down is very difficult, but you can actually get those down in your nutrition. So for me, for example, I do not actually use a lot of supplements. I actually make my smoothie, my, my liver cleanser, my kidney cleanser, my gut healer, um, my antioxidant, my phytonutrient, my um, anti, um, my um, antiviral thing all in one. And I try and drink two glasses of that a day. And I will be teaching you how to do that as well. I and, hope you'll um, make it easy for us, Taryn, because oh, it's, it's very easy. <laughs> no, no. I, I, most of my clients are incredibly busy people or they don't have time to cook or they don't know how, how to cook. So I've made my programs incredibly simple. There's nothing complicated about it. And if it is complicated, you talk to me and we will adjust it. Wonderful. So it's um, we keep it simple. And as you see, I, I've sent you, I know the Americans love their pancakes. Um, I remember eating them when I was in the States um, with syrup and bacon on it. And um, <laughs> 
horribly unhealthy. And um, so I've actually given you a recipe for my jumbo pick, um, chickpea pancakes, which don't have to be jumbo. You can make little ones and they're soft and they're easy to eat and you could put lovely toppings on them. And so that could also be a great breakfast or a 10 o'clock or a afternoon meal so that every meal becomes interchangeable. Wonderful. And Taryn, I think we put that recipe on our website and I, I think that everybody can have a chance to look at it and I still have not made it yet, but I'm going to before the end of this week. <laughs> well, that's terrific. You're, it's a little taste of you, you know, a little taste yeah. of what you have to teach us. And um, we will, Taryn will be back with us at the end of August with our other um, PWPMD programs. So thank you. Um, Dr. Rizak and Dr. Mercury, we're going to spotlight you and hopefully um, you are ready to join us. So the aldopaphobia, is it rational? Is that your question? <clears throat> um, I would say it is not rat. <clears throat> can you hear me okay? I hope you can. Um, from my point of view, it's rational to a certain degree, but to make it into a phobia is uh, way out of line. And I think, you know, some of this comes from uh, Dr. Google. Um, reading magazines or hearing it from other people um, that uh, L-DOPA can either uh, make your disease progress faster or you run out of uh, time to use it because you use it up faster. Um, it can cause dyskinesias, it, which it can do if you're not managed very carefully. Um, and so people get put on all the other drugs for Parkinson's and they can cause a lot of problems as well. And they're not nearly as effective. So there's a time and a place for L-DOPA. It has to be used judiciously, but it is the most effective drug that we have for treating the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. I think, that, I think that's the key is, is if you have um, a physician who is a specialist in movement disorders, uh, then they understand the literature. I mean, this is their passion. This is the area that they emphasize and you as the patient are their main focus. And I think that's really important because it's, as we know, Parkinson's disease is very, very complex to treat. There are so many aspects. We talk about the motor, we talk about the non-motor um, and it's, it's just something that really requires someone who has the ability to say, this is the time when we need to consider L-DOPA or this is the time when we're not gonna need L-DOPA. So I think that's an excellent point uh, that you're making. So I, you know, I would add that as Michael, Dr. Mercury said, you know, doctors can have uh, L-DOPA phobias or even agonists, dopamine agonist phobias um, because there's a lack of understanding of the drugs and what they do and how to use them properly. And uh, for example, if you, if somebody, a doctor puts a patient on Mirapex and they don't want to, they have a phobia, they're anxious, they don't want to give anybody L-DOPA, at some point, the agonist can only do so much. And then you can get impulse control disorders, uh, you can get low blood pressure, you can get hallucinations. Uh, it, it is not rational at all to, not, to be afraid to use L-DOPA or to take it. Now, I've had patients that absolutely, they want a deep brain stimulator rather than take the, deep, the, the, DB, uh, the L-DOPA and actually get improvement for a number of years. And so it makes no sense. But for some people, it's a real anxiety thing and uh, it's a real phobia. And there's nothing, it's very difficult to be able to uh, be rational with those people. I mean, I think it probably requires some psychological treatment if they're that um, phobic you know, that they become stiff, rigid, uh, they can have swallowing problems. Uh, it can be, you know, it, it, it breaks your heart to see that because it, it's not rational. And I don't know, Mike? 
Yeah, and it's life threatening. And I think, you know, the approach is, well, where is this coming from? Is it a matter of uh, they don't, the patient does not have good information? Are they being coerced by a family member uh, not, to, not to be on L-DOPA? Um, and I think the challenge is also this. So we know that uh, there's about a 60% chance of getting anxiety with just generalized anxiety with Parkinson's disease. So is this a, a longstanding anxiety? The person's been anxious all their life and this is just one more uh, target of that anxiety. Is this part of the Parkinson's disease? And maybe we need to actually be treating the anxiety first uh, to find out what's going on and then zero in on the specific phobia. So um, I think taking a look and trying to determine where is it coming from uh, becomes really important. Yes, I mean, there, there are, um, and that's exactly right. Well, what is the person afraid of would happen if they took L-DOPA? Sometimes they think they're going to get uh, Michael J. Fox dyskinesias right away, or they think it's going to really um, mess up their stomach. They're going to have stomach pain. Um, it's going to change the way they think. Uh, all these things are not rational. The, the dyskinesias, that those are extra movements, the wiggles that you see that Michael J. Fox is a good example of, are is a side effect of the medicine, but it's related to how much you take, what the dose is, and how long you've been taking it. And um, so, you know, we may start somebody out on L-DOPA because we want to get them going and feeling better. But then rather than going up on L-DOPA, we may add in, now we have a lot of other drugs that can be adjuncts to L-DOPA. So we don't have to go up on the L-DOPA dose. Um, but it, it's like, a, you know, it's a, like a Picasso, like a painting. And you use a little of this and a little of that. And you bring it all together and the patient does, does well. And when I see a patient in the office, I know Michael feels the same way. I don't just think of them today. You know, I look at them, I think of them 5, 10, 15, or more years from now. And what I do today can affect them, uh, you know, 10 years from now. So, you know, using the medications correctly at the right time for the right reasons is critical. And I think having a relationship with your physician is really important. If, if you are going to this physician, it better be someone who you trust and whose judgment you trust. Um, he or she has gone to medical school, residency, fellowship for many, many, many years and is not relying on Dr. Google um, in order to, uh, to treat you, know, you, treat you as a person, not the disease. Um, so I think that whole issue of trust, unfortunately, because of uh, misinformation uh, that's available on the media. I mean, every time a study comes out, it's published as a breakthrough. And, and those of us in the science of medicine know, no, no, you need replication. You need to look at the study. You need to do all this. And that's, that's what doctors do. So having trust in your physician is so important. When a physician gets sick and goes to another physician, they trust that physician because there's a good chance they're not an expert in what they got sick in. Uh, and you have to have that trust. And I think that's something unfortunately that uh, has been lost. Can you talk to the point of the difference between a neurologist and a movement disorder neurologist and why people with Parkinson's should go to a specialist? Well, um, start out. You want me to start? So, so a, a neurologist would be um, someone who's gone to medical school, then did a residency in neurology. And in their residency, they're exposed to different neurological disorders, including Parkinson's disease. A movement disorder specialist would then have specialized training beyond um, their residency in movement disorders, uh, most common being a fellowship. So fellowships are offered by different movement disorders programs. Um, and it's usually a two-year program that combines both research as well as clinical experience. Um, and the reason Dr. Rizek and I feel so passionately about this is because it's 
it's been our experience that the general neurologist, and they do have a role. If somebody just has a tremor, uh, maybe starting off with the general neurologist is appropriate to find out what's the cause. But if it turns out that it's Parkinson's disease, then you really want a movement disorder specialist or so a neurologist who's uh, got the specialized training like a fellowship. Uh, and the reason is the general neurologist is usually going to treat the movement. The movement disorders doctor is going to treat the movement, but also all the non-motor aspects. I am horrified when I get somebody who's coming from a general neurologist and I ask some of the basic questions. Have you seen a dermatologist? And they're looking at me like, why would I see a dermatologist? And no one's told them that they have an increased risk of skin cancer. Um, and I go through the different non-motor aspects that someone like Dr. Rizak would go through at the first couple meetings. Um, and the general neurologist just doesn't have that perspective. So that's a part of it. But I'm going to let Dr. Rizak talk about also all the knowledge that's required with the treatment as far as medications go and so on. I, I think uh, what Dr. Mercury said is absolutely true. Uh, the other part of this is experience with the medications and with patients taking the medication. I mean, I can look at a patient uh, and even without really examining them sometimes and know what I need to do and what they can tolerate and what they're not going to be able to tolerate. Um, that's experience. And that's, that's what this field is about. Movement disorders is really visual. Uh, we have to see it. Uh, we understand reactions to medications. Uh, I think it's, it's really, um, people really uh, rob themselves of quality time with their grandchildren, their children, because they're afraid to take a medication like L-DOPA that can actually make their quality of life so much better. It has to be monitored, but that's what we do. And um, the other thing is now that there are new formulations of carbidopa, levodopa that we, I think are better. We, they're sort of a, they're really long acting or slow release. And uh, I think that may be a better formulation, a use factor of many formulations. Um, so I think that you really, and I, I understand the phobia. I think I can understand where it comes from. The problem is they believe, uh, patients believe what they read or somebody told them more than what I'm telling them. And I, there's nothing I can do really. It's, it's unfortunate that I see them debilitated not moving, not being, being able to swallow because they're afraid of uh, L-DOPA. And it's really, uh, it's a myth. It's been shown in this day and age, L-DOPA does not make the disease progress faster. It doesn't upset your stomach. Uh, it helps your symptoms and you don't use it up faster because you've started it. You know, it's not like, um, I don't know what, like a narcotic, you need more and more and more. If you need more L-DOPA, or other drugs is because of the disease is progressing, uh, not because you started L-DOPA you know, a year ago. So uh, I think the understanding, sometimes I don't realize what patients are thinking, uh, why they're not taking it. So now I'm, I've taken to asking like, why wouldn't you take this medicine? And when they explain it to me, then I can give them the counter uh, argument with facts, with science, and uh, sometimes that works, you know, I hope it does because it is, it is not really a rational fear uh, of, a, of medicine, of that particular medicine. And I think you brought, uh, Dr. Rizek, you brought up a good point about um, treatment of the phobia and um, I mean, cognitive behavioral therapy uh, is one of its uh, foundations is looking at irrational thoughts. Uh, and helping the patient work through those process, uh, the feelings associated with those. So if you have the right um, psychotherapist available who is knowledgeable in Parkinson's disease uh, and specifically in L-DOPA, uh, that, that could be a definite treatment. Uh, because like you say, it, it robs people of uh, wonderful moments of life, but it's also life-threatening ultimately. Uh, when you think of bed sores that can occur and, and all the other problems if someone's not able to move. Correct, yes. I mean, there are phobias in Parkinson's that I see uh, 
somewhat related, but patients are afraid to use a walker. The balance is bad, they've been falling, but they feel if they use a walker, they've given in to the disease, and uh, which is not rational. They're gonna give in to their disease when they fall and need to be in the hospital for two weeks. So, you know, uh, we have to be, there's a time and a place for everything. And um, it doesn't change who you are. It doesn't change uh, what you've accomplished, who your person, what your personality is. It's, we use what we need to use to stay safe and have a long, uh, fruitful life. No, exactly. And again, I think it really comes back to trust and also the experience of your physician. I mean, those are, those are key. You, you've got to have trust uh, in your physician. Yes. Um, so, um, I, there's a question here. Um, when is the optimal time to start taking L-DOPA? Does that, I don't know what is the, the time of day or the time in your life? Maybe you, you could speak to both of those the time of day and the time of your life? Well, it's when the symptoms are significant enough and everybody's different, you know, when they start interfering with their life. So a patient will not go to the bingo game because, or, or to a lecture because they don't want anybody to see their tremor or they don't want to be, uh, you know, sort of bent over or any of these things. So social restrictions, physical restrictions. Um, we don't wait till things really get bad. We like to be proactive. Uh, but when we see that this coming, uh, that's when we start treating with medications. And sometimes we do start with an agonist. Sometimes we do start with another medicine. But often we start with L-DOPA because it's our gold standard medication. And uh, we at least get that going and then we can have, use adjunctive medicine as time goes by. So when there's not the optimal time to start it or in the course of the illness, the illness is when there's a, enough of a, a problem with movement uh, that, it, it, that it warrants it. Yeah, I think that's really important. And I, I wanna go back to uh, Michael J. Fox example because a lot of people use him as an example. He's a wonderful philanthropist and, and uh, the advocacy he does is fantastic. Um, but what people don't realize is he's very young onset Parkinson's disease. That's not what most people are. So while on the one hand, you can make some comparisons, on the other hand, he is physiologically different as far as patients go. And again, that brings me back to what you see on the internet is not always accurate. <laughs> so you really need someone who's informed who can, uh, who can help you navigate this. The other advantage um, I would say of being part of a movement disorder specialist's practice is that there are lots of people with Parkinson's disease and other movement disorders. And that gives you two advantages. One is if you are worried about the L-DOPA, maybe there's a patient who's willing to talk to you about their experience or several patients who can talk to you about their experience with L-DOPA. Well, that's Marlene right here. Marlene just wrote in the chat that she's been, she's had, Marlene, do you want to tell us or no? No, wait, your sound is off. Okay, I got, I came down, I got diagnosed with Parkinson's in 1999, and I was 48 years old, and I've been on L-DOPA since he gave it to me to see if I had Parkinson's. So I've been on it all 22 years, and I'm now on the pump, so it just goes in. I would, I wouldn't worry about it. My husband and I decided in 1999 that we were going to get the best life we could up front. And if the things came on because I was on it so long, we do deal with it now. But um, I can still do do-over. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. Thank and you, Marlene. I think the research wow. sheds a, a, 
on quality of life has shown that um, patients who delay the onset, the use of, of L-DOPA really have lost a lot of quality of life uh, by the time they decide to take it. And that, that big period of time uh, is basically, you know, out the window where they couldn't pick up their grandchild and you know, all those things we like to do. And there's no disadvantage to starting it when the doctor says that you really need it. Uh, that, that, that's been shown time and time again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think we could open it up to Q&A right now. So if anybody wants to raise their hand and ask a question, we're happy to take them. Arlene Sulkis. Arlene, hi. Hi. This is my husband, Sheldon Silverman. He had the question for you. Okay. Uh, thank you for taking my question. Is there a relationship between cognitive issues and Parkinson's disease? So the one thing we say about patients with Parkinson's disease is everyone is very different, but there is um, a chance of cognitive changes with Parkinson's disease. Um, and that's my area of specialty. So one of the most common things that I see, and often early on, um, even before people realize they're having it, is slowed processing of information. And what I mean by that is it doesn't affect intelligence, but it just takes longer to work through a problem, to come up with a decision. I've had young people who have had young onset, so in their 40s who have come in, and unfortunately, before they saw me or saw someone like Dr. Rizak, got fired because they went from being able to manage five projects to being able to only manage three projects, and people thought that they were lazy. So slowed processing is one of the common ones, and I believe early on that can be a problem that people don't even notice. The other one that I would say uh, related to that uh, is sometimes word finding. It's not really a language problem, though. It's actually part of that slowed processing of information. Next one that we often see will be problems with memory, and the most common is difficulty recalling information. Uh, so that kind of tip of the tongue uh, sort of phenomenon we all have when we see a movie star and we can't remember their name and we say we forgot. But if, if you um, really think about it, it comes back to you later. Or if you don't think about it, it comes back to you later. Um, so difficulty retrieving information that you know. So that's the second most. And then the third one that I tend to see are visual spatial changes. Uh, this is probably a little bit later, but some of my patients will say when they're driving, they notice they have to really concentrate to stay in the middle of the lane. They might drift a little bit, uh, primarily towards the yellow line. So those are the three most cognitively, um, I would say, salient uh, areas that I see among patients. But some people have none of those also. So. Um, so, so it doesn't mean one is going to get those. Is going one might get one of them, one might get none of them. Everyone is literally different. Okay. Dr. Rizak, would you add anything on the cognitive? Well, I, I would agree agree with you, and I'd emphasize the fact that I don't think it's in terms of an early symptom is as common. Uh, it, sometimes in the later stages of Parkinson's, it it can be because we're getting older and. Uh, we're having more not enough neurons to process things it's all additive but um as an early symptom i don't i don't see it as much but some the non-motor features of parkinson's any of them can be an early uh forebearer of the motor like sleep disorders or blood pressure fluctuations and things like that can really herald you know, the future onset of Parkinson's disease, but everybody is different. And that's part of the, the problem too, is that it's so variable uh, that uh, it's not like reading an EKG, you know, uh, you either got a heart attack or you don't, but this is very uh, clinical and it requires experience and understanding. And I think, uh, Dr. Mercury is great. He, he gets it right away. He probably can make the diagnosis in the first five seconds of seeing the patient, but it's experience. And that, that's the important part of movement disorders, uh, care. 
I think, and that's a wonderful point. It's, it's not something that we would see before the movement, but let's say somebody has attentional problems before they've got the movement, then it's probably the anxiety because we know anxiety can predate uh, the actual motor problem. And what does anxiety do cognitively? It hits us at the level of attention concentration. Depression, new onset adult depression can sometimes predate the motor. And what does depression do? Slow processing of information and memory problems, exactly what you described. So if we do see those early on, those are treatable and potentially reversible. Mm -hmm. Terrific. What kind of doctor would you seek for that information to be cared for by a particular specialty? Well, you know, are you talking about the cognitive problems? Yes. I think, uh, Michael, I'll let you take it. That's your area of expertise. In relation to anxiety and possible depression on just finding out that you may have Parkinson's disease. Right. So I would start actually with the movement disorder specialist. Okay. Uh, because yeah. usually they are going to um, treat any and, and diagnose any early uh, depression or anxiety. So I would start with them. Um, and then if it's uh, beyond that and it looks like it is cognitive, uh, like I was describing, um, then a couple ways you can go. One is a neuropsychologist. Um, so those are a PhD or PsyD clinical psychologist with a fellowship in neuropsychology. And you'd, you'd want somebody who's got experience. Well, we have to mute, uh, people, everybody should mute themselves if they're making noise there. Okay. And Maybe. You, you want somebody with experience in Parkinson's disease. So I've got 26 years of experience uh, in this area. So the key is not going to any neuropsychologist, but asking your movement disorder specialist, who does he or she use for neuropsychology? Because you definitely want someone with experience. Because if they don't have experience, they're just going to give a bunch of tests and, and the, you're not going to get the quality, you're not going to get the depth of the interpretation. And then the third specialist we sometimes use is another type of medical doctor, behavioral neurologist. So this is also a neurologist who's done a fellowship, but they've yeah. done it in brain behavior relationships. So those would be the three. Start off with your movement disorder specialist, next right. neuropsychologist, and then thirdly would be behavioral neurologist. Just as another tidbit, um, sometimes uh, a patient is undertreated or they've refused to take some medicine uh, as we're talking about today. And that, that actually, they're having an off episode, which also can apply to the non-motor features. And so when a patient's not moving well, or they're off, their symptoms are not being managed right, they could be depressed as well and anxious and not think as well. Uh, that happens occasionally. So we, we know that. And uh, I always, before I send somebody to Dr. Mercury, I will, uh, I want to make sure their medications are managed properly. And then I'll, once I do that, I'll observe to see if there's any uh, improvement. If the patient can walk now and can eat by themselves, a lot of times the, the emotional things get much, much better. So I have one last question. Um, since my husband has been diagnosed having Parkinson's at the beginning of January, 2020. Just three weeks ago, he started to go on uh, carbidopa, lobidopa. He started with a half a pill twice a day. Then the following week, a half a pill three times a day. And now as of today, he's on one pill going forward three times a day. Um, he's got a tremor in his right hand and right foot, but there are many times that the tremor stops. It's not constant. Um, I just uh, am wondering, is this, was this the right time for him to go on the medication? Well, that's, I mean, again, I don't know your husband uh, in detail, but um, if the tremor is bothering him, uh, and he's probably has some other symptoms too. It's usually not just the tremor. There's some stiffness and a little slowness. It's on one side. Yes. Uh, if it's bothering him enough, then it's worth treating. Or if he won't go out or it's, he can't go to work because or use the mouse, you know, on the computer, then it's worth treating it. And 
one of the things about Parkinson's tumors is it can be, it's a little tricky. It's not like the other symptoms. It can be a little resistant to the medications. And sometimes we have to try different Parkinson medications to really get at the tremor. Uh, but what he's taking now is a very, uh, is a, the actual starting dose for most patients is one tablet of 25, 100, three times a day. So he, it's worth uh, stopping there for a little while, see what it does to the tremor. If it doesn't do enough, then the doctor can try something else or give you a little more. Thank, Thank you. you. Can I ask a question, please? Sure. Why would a neurologist prescribe Aldopa and Mirapric together? That's exactly what Aldopa and what? Mirapix. I, I didn't hear that. Mirapix. Mirapix. Oh, and Mirapix? Well, because they're at the Mirapix is adjunctive. It's not as potent as Aldopa, but it does improve symptoms. So rather than giving a higher dose of Aldopa, we use the other drugs to get the benefit that we need without having to increase the Aldopa. So these are, they all work together. We call it polypharmacy. So we use many different drugs to help the, the, the dopamine levels raise uh, so we don't have to go too high on any one of them. So polypharmacy is classic Parkinson's disease and patients aren't used to that. Patients like to take one pill for cholesterol and that's it. But with Parkinson's, you've got to come at it from different angles of attack. And that actually keeps the patient safer and healthier longer. So could we take, to, take them together or one at a time? Space. I mean, it depends. I don't know the details of what he said to you, the doctor, but you can take them together. But I'm saying, do I gain by separating them? Do I gain anything? Are you gaining anything? Is In terms you're... of functionality. Uh, Michael, I didn't quite get that one. The function, your function, your function? Yeah. Your functionality. Oh, well, so the question is whether both of them, well, they both contribute to functionality. And, um, you know, the, the agonist, the Mirapex, is a longer acting medication. So sometimes when the. This. Uh, Whoops, did Dr. Rezac just freeze? I think he did. Oh. I'll give him a, a minute. Yeah. I just want to say one thing while, uh, is that. Everybody should know that you have to contact your own physician for specific designing. diagnostic and treatment questions. So just want to make sure that everybody knows that this is a, a broad topic for everybody, not specific. Yeah, please be aware of that because we haven't examined you. So so everyone is different. And, and that's what we take pride in uh, is really treating the person again, like I said earlier, not the disease. Uh, while we're waiting for Dr. Rizek to, to jump back on, let me talk about one other thing that is very, very important everyone's aware of, and that's sleep disorders. One in three Americans has a sleep disorder. Two out of three people with Parkinson's have a sleep disorder. And sleep disorders cause cognitive issues, or at least amplify cognitive issues. I shouldn't say cause. Amplify cognitive issues like memory problems, like attention problems. So please, if you have a spouse who is snoring and you have to listen to make sure other times that they're still breathing, they could have sleep apnea if their legs are moving at night and waking you up. All those sorts of things, acting out dreams at night, those disrupt good quality sleep and good quality sleep is necessary for both the body and the mind to being restored at night. So um, just be aware of that sleep is, is huge. Disrupt your sleep, only mine. All right. Does anybody have any questions? A raise of hand. Anybody? Is that Diane? Are you? Do you have a question? I'm not sure if I see your hand raising. Okay. Okay. Um, I have a question. Oh, Mindy. What? I see Mindy Roller. Could but turn on your sound, Mindy. I don't think so. Thank. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, so my my question is, what other kinds of things? I, I happen to be somebody, I don't think I'm phobic about it, but I have not started any kind of L-DOPA 
or any other real medication for my Parkinson's. Um, and I am seeing a, you know, a movement disorder specialist. Good. The question is, are there things that you can do to maintain your cognitive skills and abilities other than taking medication? What other should, things should be considered? The number one thing that the research suggests for both Parkinson's disease, uh, but also for staving off Alzheimer's disease, which we're all at risk for. So the big risk for Alzheimer's is age, um, is physical exercise. And if your doctor allows aerobic exercise specifically is huge. Um, and the idea is it's getting more blood to the brain. There are these factors in the brain called neurotrophic factors. It increases those that increases brain health. That helps amazingly for Parkinson's disease, as well as uh, staving off, we believe, uh, Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. So often, uh, if our patients are having difficulties, they'll start with uh, doing something like um, uh, LSVT big, where they will get a prescription to see the physical therapist and go through uh, that four week, uh, four days a week uh, program uh, through physical therapy. Uh, that's done. And then uh, they will often help advise what kind of exercise can they do. Uh, but number one would be exercise. Uh, other general things not specific to Parkinson's disease, though, is just social interaction. Uh, we believe that is helpful. There's something called the mind diet. I don't know if you all have heard about it. Maybe um, Karen wants to add to that about nutrition. Yes. Taryn, you want yeah, to say Taryn, did you want to... Taryn, can you hear me? I can. Um, um, yes, I think that nutrition plays an enormous big part in this. In fact, sometimes nutrition is, I wouldn't say the start of a lot of things, but it, it certainly does um, have a, an impact on it. And if you're eating badly, and they always say disease starts and ends with what you put in your mouth. So if you um, don't eat properly, it's going to have a profound effect on your your whole system, your whole metabolic system, um, and also your processing of, of your food is very important. If you're not chewing properly, it's just silly little things. Like if you don't chew properly, if you don't metabolize well, if you don't absorb well, these are things that you need to be working on and making sure that that is your, really your first port of call and start early in life. Don't wait for things to happen to change your nutrition. Start early in life. Exercise and nutrition are paramount to stay for disease. We've got Dr. Rizak back. Yeah, I think we have time for one, one, one or two more questions. Sure. Anybody want to raise their hand? I don't have a hand, but I have a question. Where's the, who's that? Maya. Maya, okay, go ahead. Um, can you comment please on, does, does levodopa exacerbate uh, orthostatic hypotension. Uh, is well, I would leave Dr. that to Rizak. Rizak, but you're muted, uh, Dr. Rizak. There you are. Okay, just unmute. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know what happened. I, all the power in the building went out. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's that good to have happen. you back. <laughs> yes, thank you. So, you know, uh, so yes, L-DOPA, the agonists, all of them can contribute to orthostatic hypotension. So um, if somebody's prone to that, you, we have to be careful, very careful. And we have also have medications that we can use if it's essential for the patient to, to, to be on, to be functional, but it causes a side effect. Uh, then we use uh, Northera or Midadrine or Florinef. Those are the main medications. But make sure you're hydrated. That's the other thing. Most patients do not drink enough water. Not like Dr. Mercury. <laughs> he does the right thing. Tara, you want to say something about water? No, it's fine. I'm... Okay. <laughs> Drinking. Yeah. Even if you're not thirsty, you have to drink water, right? Because a lot of times you don't feel thirsty. Well, here's the thing. As we grow older, we lose our sense of thirst in a sense. It takes longer to kick in. 
um, and that's in our 50s, 60s, 70s, and that's just normal aging. So you might not feel thirsty, but a good rule of thumb is when you go to the bathroom, the urine should be the color of a post-it note, kind of a light yellow. If it's darker than that, you're not drinking enough water. That's from the Mayo Clinic. So um, that's a good rule of thumb you can use. So probably about five or six um, eight ounce glasses of water minimum is what you should be drinking. You'll right. go to the bathroom more and you'll be mad at me. But remember one thing, and this is what one of my colleagues in geriatrics says, busy kidneys are happy kidneys. So <laughs> that That's terrific. Well, right. I want to thank this. Oh, do you want to say one more thing, Dr. Rizek? I was just going to add, Dr. Mercury has the right idea. If you can fill up a container with six to eight, something like that, glasses of water. And by the end of the day, if it's empty or close to empty, you've done a good job. And because it's very hard to keep track. Mm -hmm. um, and he, he, he knows how to do it. Okay. <laughs> That's true. Can I just pop in there? One of the ways a lot of people don't like drinking water. So having a great smoothie, a nice vegetable smoothie, a green smoothie with a lot of water in it, um, you're actually taking all that water in without actually sipping water because I do see a lot of people who will not touch water. But there are other ways of actually getting it in, soups and things like that, where you are still keeping, you are hydrated and still getting your food in. That's true. Yeah. Excellent. I can't have my donut with that smoothie, can I? No. <laughs> well, we can negotiate. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you very much for coming to lunch with us, lunch with our doctors and lunch with our nutritionist. Um, I want to tell you that we will be. Thank you, everybody. We appreciate you being a part of our community and we're happy to serve you. And we always like to hear your feedback. Um, we will be having two more in the month of August, August 24th and 26th. It's Tuesday and Thursday. So um, I hope you will join us then. We'll send you out some information. Also, you can always email us questions. So we are happy. I will send, you know, people who have questions and we couldn't get them answered because maybe they were a little personal. I will send them to Taryn and to Dr. Rizak and Dr. Mercury. So, and they will personally answer them for you. So we'll, we'll try and make that happen. So I want to thank everybody. You're welcome. Thank you. thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you, thank you Susan. Rizak. Thank you, Taryn. Bye, thank you, Dr. Mercury. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good Thank day. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye. Bye. What a nice team. That was great. Thank you, Karen. She's still talking. Okay, how are you? She just got feelings. What do you mean? She got a yes, Pierce? No.